Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, sir. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Did you notice how did I enter the classroom? If you carefully notice that the person who was entering the classroom, there were few important features. Number one, the person entering was very slow pace. Number two, his hands were like this that is called a slowness of motion, hands were rigid, the face was very expressionless and there is a imbalance of the body. Now, that is what are called as the cardinal features of Parkinsonism and this is a what the Parkinsonism means? The disease Parkinsonism is a neurological degenerative disorder, which means that the neurons in the brain, which are primarily dopaminergic in nature, they selectively get degenerated and there is a progression in degenerative process. This usually starts after 60 years of age and progresses beyond that. Therefore, this is called as a progressive neurodegenerative disorder. There are four cardinal signs of uh, Parkinson's disease, which you might have seen. One is the muscle rigidity and this muscle rigidity is also called as cog wheel rigidity that means, if you put it like this, it is like a cog wheel and this is the typical rigidity of Parkinsonism. When a person has any activity to be done, the action is usually slower than the normal and if a person takes 5 minutes to come from the main entry to the podium instead of 30 seconds, this is called as a typical bradykinesia. There is also when I am sitting here, my, there are tremors. It is not the tremor which you see in anxiety, it is not the tremor which you see in thyroid disease, it is the tremor which you see usually in even in the resting stage. This tremor gets exaggerated when you become conscious of your disease or when you are tense. So, you see the patient of Parkinson has a small tremors all the time, but it may, may be exaggerated when there is a tension. There is also the fourth is the gait disturbance. And the simplest thing is when you draw a straight line and if you see that the person is on the straight line, he walks not on the straight line, but he walks like this, he cannot follow the straight line and that is called as a postural instability or the gait disturbance. Typically, 
if you crack a joke or if you become aggressive there is a no expression on the patient of parkinsonism that is why it is called as a mask like face and in addition the parkinsonism patient also have anxiety they also have a depression they also have a forgetfulness that is called as a cognitive impairment and therefore this is the anxiety and parkinsonism is overlap the anxiety parkinsonism and depression overlaps so this indicates that many times the patient of parkinsonism also get anti anxiety drug also get anti depressant drug also may get anti cognitive and uh, uh, or cognitive enhancement drug that does not mean that they are primarily drug of parkinsonism now if you just see what is the etiopathology of parkinsonism the most important cause of parkinsonism is idiopathic that means we usually do not know what is the contributing factor in addition to the age people have identified several environmental toxins pesticides and other things which can gradually desensitize or degenerate the dopaminergic neuron one of the environmental toxin called as mptp or 6 hydroxy dopamine these are the drugs which are chemicals which can cause the selective dopaminergic de degeneration and they are often also used as to produce experimental parkinsonism in animals but largely we do not know that if this is the specific chemical in environment or this is the genetic difference which is contributing to the parkinsonism many times after a stroke ischemic stroke particularly or sometime the hemorrhagic stroke the post stroke sequelae also there is a dopaminergic neuron degeneration which leads to parkinsonism like symptoms the another group of agents which can cause parkinsonism are the drugs which block the dopaminergic neuron for the immediately this is the drug this is the receptor and this drug blocks the dopaminergic receptor and therefore this dopaminergic receptor blocker blockade will cause temporary symptoms of parkinsonism this is also called as a parkinsonism like syndrome or this is also called as a extra pyramidal reaction of the drugs this will naturally happen with all the drugs which have anti dopaminergic property or dopamine receptor blocking action and if you see the drugs which can cause that is the anti psychotic drugs haloperidol is commonly used anti psychotic drug chlorpromazine which is widely used drug for vomiting in children refractory vomiting and also the commonly used anti emetic vomiting metoclopramide metoclopramide is a drug which acts on by blocking the dopamine receptor on chemo receptor trigger zone and therefore preventing the vomiting but when this dopamine blockade also occurs in the brain it causes the temporary symptoms of parkinsonism and that is called as a extra pyramidal reaction and if you remember that is why metoclopramide is now a days less preferred than domperidon which does not cross the blood brain barrier and therefore you do not get the parkinsons like syndrome side effect the if you just compare these two pictures here this is the substantia nigra and in this substantia nigra you see that this is a pigmented substantia nigra this is a dopaminergic neuron 
which has been shown here and this dopaminergic neurons if you see here this is a diminished in substantia nigra. Now, usually the dopaminergic neurons as with other neurons also they get decreased over a period of time, but when the dopaminergic neurons are reduced in number functional dopaminergic neurons decreases more than 70 to 80 percent only then symptoms appear before that that means the dopaminergic degeneration the neurodegeneration starts much earlier but the symptoms appear much later and because the other dopaminergic neurons take care of that now this is the if you just see the broad pathophysiology this is a dopaminergic neuron and this has an inhibitory influence of cholinergic neuron so this is the dopaminergic neuron this is the cholinergic transmission and this has a inhibitory influence on this and when there is a parkinsonism the dopaminergic neuron decreases and therefore the influence inhibitory influence on then as, as this cholinergic system increases and this goes up. So, what you finally see that dopaminergic neuron and cholinergic transmission imbalance whereas, the dopaminergic transmission decreases and also there is a relative increase in cholinergic transmission. Therefore, if you just see how the strategy would be the strategy of treatment would be that e to correct this imbalance that means decreased dopaminergic activity your approach is to increase the dopaminergic activity the increased cholinergic activity because of relative lack of inhibition to reduce the cholinergic activity. So, two approaches one is decreasing dopaminergic activity the other is increasing choler decreasing cholinergic activity and the third approach is that you approach both together in some patient increasing dopaminergic activity and reducing cholinergic activity. Now this is the goal increase dopaminergic activity and how can you increase dopaminergic activity you can give any intervention which will increase synthesis which will reduce the degradation that is a metabolism which will increase the uh, decrease the reuptake process that means the more of dopamine remain in the in the synaptic cleft or you give from outside the drugs which act on the dopaminergic receptor. On the other hand the strategy to reduce cholinergic transmission would be to give specific anti cholinergic drugs which will act on the brain not act on the periphery, but act less on the periphery and reduce the cholinergic transmission. Some symptoms like rigidity and uh, bradycardia or bradykinesia these two symptoms respond better to anti cholinergic drugs and other symptoms respond better to anti to dopaminergic enhancing mechanism. Now, this is uh, if you just see a summary a simplified diagram of a dopaminergic nerve terminal there is three important things you see one is the mechanism of how dopamine is released in the synaptic cleft from tyrosine there is a converted by tyrosine hydroxylase to L dopa and L dopa is converted to dopamine by dopa decarboxylase enzyme and this dopamine is now stored into vesicles in the presynaptic nerve terminal and then this vesicle is ruptured and by exocytosis this is released as a neurotransmitter in dopaminergic nerve terminal. After 
this release this acts on the post synaptic receptor which are ion channel and this post synaptic receptors are either D2 receptor primarily in Parkinsonism or D1 receptor also and then this causes all action. Now, this released dopamine can also go up back to the neurotrans back to the neuron and this is called as an uptake mechanism. This released dopamine also gets metabolized extra neuronally if you just see this into the liver primarily by an enzyme and there are a specific enzyme for example, the extra neuronal metabolism is primarily by catechol amine O methyl transferase called as COMT and when it goes inside the neuron the inside the neuron it is primarily metabolized by enzyme called as monoamine oxidase. Now, monoamine oxidase are primarily of two types which is called as a MAO A which is mainly seen in elementary canal and MAO B which is primarily predominantly present in the brain and just for the remembering sake you can say B for brain and MAO B is more predominantly present in brain. Now, if you look for what could be the strategy of uh, treatment uh, for enhancing the dopaminergic transmission could be a you increase the dopamine concentration. Dopamine does not cross the blood brain barrier therefore, we give L dopa. You give L dopa in a high dose it goes into the brain only small quantity of the drug reaches into the brain and then it will convert it into dopamine. Therefore, dopamine because it does not cross the blood brain barrier is not the drug which can be given in Parkinsonism is the levodopa. Levodopa is also converted into dopamine outside the brain. Therefore, you want to give a drug together which will more concentrate the levodopa into the brain. The second approach would be that you give the drug which reduces the which reduces the monoamine oxidase enzyme. So, that the, the destruction or the metabolism of dopamine becomes less and that is called as monoamine oxidase inhibitors and in this particularly MAO or monoamine oxidase B inhibitor are used. The third approach could be that you also give COMT inhibitor which will also reduce the metabolism peripheral metabolism of dopamine therefore, increasing the amount of dopamine present here. Third approach is you directly act on the receptor post synaptic receptor. So, you give dopamine receptor agonist primarily dopamine D2 receptor agonist. As I said if you remember I said primarily dopamine D 2 receptors are involved, but also D 1 is involved. Therefore, the drug which will be receptor agonist would be D 2 receptor agonist, but the drug which have D 2 plus D 1 receptor agonist also will be slightly better. So, now if you recap the drugs would be for enhancing dopaminergic transmission is the drugs which will increase the release or uh, in the synaptic cleft is levodopa. B the drug which will reduce the metabolism that is the intraneuronal mechanism monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. C the drug which will reduce the metabolism in extra neuronal mechanism that is COMT inhibitor D the dopamine receptor agonist acting at the post synaptic D 2 and D 1 receptor and 5 the drugs which will shift the dopamine L dopa 
into the brain that is the carbidopa and that is what the strategy we apply. Now just to recap here, so therefore if you sum up the drugs used to increase dopaminergic activity is number one dopamine precursor that is levodopa because dopamine itself cannot grow cannot go enter into the blood brain barrier dopamine agonist these are the two type of dopamine agonist ergot alkaloids bromocryptin and the another one is pergolide number two there are non ergot also like apomorphine apomorphine is one of the most powerful dopamine receptor agonist but it is not used much clinically because it stimulates dopamine receptors at chemoreceptor trigger zone therefore it causes vomiting so apomorphine is most of the time used as a drug given seriously to use vomiting in poisoning cases you must remember therefore that apomorphine will only be used in severe cases of Parkinsonism where immediate relief is required and it can be given subcutaneously, but it is not given routinely for long duration. The other drug is monoamine oxidase B inhibitor and these drugs selagiline and rasagiline. Now this has uh, an advantage because when the dopamine is metabolized to by monoamine oxidase inhibitor it causes release of free radical. Also when levodopa is converted into dopamine it also causes release of free radical that means the free radicals are released at two stages one is when the dopamine is synthesized from precursor the other is when it is metabolized by metabolizing enzyme and with that logic a drug which has an additive anti oxidant property will be useful and fortunately Mau B inhibitors selagiline and rasagiline both have significant antioxidant property and that is why they are they have been used. COMT inhibitors as I said for preventing extra neuronal metabolism of dopamine are entacapon and tolcapon these are the two used drugs and this mechanism is less important than the other therefore these drugs are not primary line of treatment but are often supplemented with other drugs increase in in dopamine release from the transmitter and this drug is amantadine and this is again a primarily antiviral drug but it is also been found to be effective in release of dopamine therefore this has also been tested and found to be useful in some cases of Parkinsonism. Now the other part if I said if you remember the dopaminergic transmission is decreased and because of the loss of inhibition the, the balance of is shifted and cholinergic mechanism is increased therefore the other approach is to reduce the cholinergic by giving anticholinergic or anti muscarinic agent there are many muscarinic agents are several starting from atropine homotropine like that but in this case we use anticholinergic drugs primarily which do not have much action on the periphery but will have action mainly on the brain and these are trihexyphenidyl and benztropine. So these are the two drugs which are primarily used in Parkinsonism. Naturally 
when these drugs will act on Parkinsonism, this will also have some effect on the periphery. Therefore, the side effect of these anticholinergic drugs in patient of Parkinsonism would be that of anticholinergic system that is dryness of mouth, constipation, urinary retention and precipitation of glaucoma. This is important particularly in old age when the patient is having a constipation as a usual feature. Therefore, when you are prescribing anticholinergic drugs to a patient of elderly patient of Parkinsonism, you must ensure that there is a adequate amount of water intake which will partly relieve this side effect of constipation. You must also see that this is given at a time that urinary retention is a possibility. Therefore, you must ensure that that he passes urine. You must not give this to any patient who has history of glaucoma because anticholinergic drugs are known to precipitate glaucoma. This may also cause dryness of mouth and the patient may come with a complaint that his mouth is always dry and therefore, you must pre warn the patient that dryness of mouth may happen with these drugs nothing to worry about it take sips of water and have a frequent water intake. Now, we just talk about the levodopa which is the main stay of Parkinson's treatment. This is a it is a dopamine precursor and it is decarboxylated from levodopa to dopamine and this enters via L amino acid transporter. When you use transporter that means this is an active transport into the brain it is not a passive diffusion and that is why you sometimes get a higher concentration in brain. And what is the mechanism of action of this is that it stimulates dopamine receptor and also may stimulate dopamine D 1 receptor. As I said primarily it is a dopamine receptor which is involved, but if it also blocks the dopamine D 1 receptor this will add to the mechanism of action or to the efficacy of the drug. When you are giving levodopa to a patient you must carefully warn him that it should be taken 30 to 60 minutes before meals. This is one of the uncommon example where the drug is more effective when you take before meal otherwise majority of the drugs are advocated to be taken after meals to reduce the side effects because the food delays the absorption of the drug and therefore, always ask the patient to have a gap of at least 30 to 60 minutes before the levodopa intake and the food administration. The half life of the drug is 1 to 2 hours it indicates that it has to be given more frequently and therefore, people are developing now the long stand long release or sustained release dopamine preparation and also when you combine with the levodopa enzyme the half life increases and uh, the half life is 1 to 3 hours the maximum effect is between 1 to 2 hours. If you just see here when you have this dopamine given by periphery by injection or oral then this does not enter the brain this is because this is the blood brain barrier. And what you give is levodopa and this levodopa is now transferring going into the brain and only it is about 1 to 2 percent of the levodopa which enters into the brain. Of this 1 to 2 percent only a fraction reaches substantia nigra. Therefore, the availability of the dopamine in the action at the site of action substantia nigra is very very small. So, what you do here is this levodopa and in brain also this is converted into carboxylase 
and here this is also converted into dopa d carboxylase enzyme. So, what we do here is only 1 to 3 percent of levodopa enters brain if given alone and now if we and this high degree of dopamine present in the periphery it will cause the side effect and the side effect because of dopamine would be it may cause nausea vomiting because it will stimulate the chemoreceptor trigger zone. It will cause orthostatic hypotension because the elderly people are getting up from the bed suddenly this they may fall or there may be severe fall in the blood pressure and there may be cardiac problems sometimes arrhythmias because the dopamine will act on the heart dopamine receptor will be converted into noradrenaline and adrenaline and therefore, all side effects and the less effect in the brain. So, what you do? You now want to reduce the dopamine in the periphery, transfer it more to the brain and this can be done by in reducing the dopa decarboxylase in the periphery. That is called as action of carbidopa or or peripheral dopa decarboxylase inhibitor and that is how you increase the concentration of uh, levodopa into the brain. And in practice levodopa is always combined into carbidopa with carbidopa in a fixed proportion. Therefore, levodopa and carbidopa are most of the time are available as fixed dose combination in a specific ratio usually 1 is to 10 ratio and they are never carbidopa is pharmacologically otherwise inert. It is the dopamine increasing mechanism. Adverse effect of levodopa is if there is an over correction of the dopaminergic mechanism you may get involuntary rhythm movement. Again this was a movement disorder Parkinsonism and now we have over corrected it therefore, you may get the rhythm movement and within 2 years of levodopa. Choreoacetosis of face and may be ex distal extremities and these are dose dependent phenomena. The increasing dose usually patient of Parkinsonism is started with the lowest dose and the dose is titrated upwards till the symptoms improve and there is a maximum dose of levodopa carbidopa is when the patient reaches at a level where he feels adverse effects. Very significant and very distinct feature of levodopa therapy is wearing of phenomena and this appears at Sim that means, I am giving a person of Parkinsonism levodopa treatment with carbidopa and after few days sometimes weeks and sometimes months the patient does not respond and patient's symptoms appear. This is because you your dopaminergic receptors are already 80 percent lost what you are giving is the drug dopamine agonist which will stimulate the remaining 20 or 10 percent dopamine receptor. Now, if you if you hammer these receptors too much then these receptors remaining receptors will not get time to rest or re-energize and these receptors may get desensitized. Therefore, after some time you have to stop this drug and then leave these receptors for regeneration or resensitization. This is called as on and then you again give the drug after maybe a one day gap. This is called as off phenomena and this is called as on phenomena. So, this is usually called as on off phenomena and to prevent this what you do is to reducing the wearing of the drug you have what is called specifically in this 
a drug holiday. What is drug holiday? That means after every 7 days or 6 days on Sunday you do not give the patient dopaminergic drug or anti Parkinsonism drug allow the patient's dopaminergic receptors to regenerate and then on Monday you start the treatment again. This drug holiday is a very classical because when you are giving a drug holiday not giving the patient a drug the patient will have worsening of the symptoms and at that time patient should be forewarned that to be in the hospital not or to be in the whole house and be under supervision and also not to do any fine work like driving machine work at machine and tell him that the symptoms may get partially worsen, but then this is being done for that the symptoms can get better next day. And this is what is called as a rapid fluctuation in hypokinesia, rigidity and dyskinesia this can happen. This is called as on off phenomena in Parkinsonism. The side effect because the sum of the dopamine will act on the chemoreceptor trigger zone D2 receptor will cause nausea and, and anorexia. If there is a vomiting never give anti dopaminergic drug as anti emetic because then it will also counter the dopaminergic benefit. So, in such case the vomiting induced by levodopa should be treated with not anti dopaminergic drug by anti cholinergic drugs. Hypotension can happen particularly in elderly population because the autonomic nervous system is not that strong. So, one has to be careful sometimes because of overcorrection, there may be symptoms of agitation, delusion, hallucination or what you call as a schizophrenic symptoms. In that case one should correlate that is it because of the drug or is it because of the overcorrection and that is the time when the titration of the dose is required. Certain drugs should not be given or should be given with caution vitamin B 6 because this is a cofactor monoamine oxidase inhibitors if they are getting monoamine oxidase inhibitor which act on the periphery also and not on the brain then this may have an interaction. Dopaminergic drug should not be given if the patient has psychosis because the dopaminergic system is involved in the behavioral alteration. Active peptic ulcer or melanoma because sometimes the bleeding has been reported in that. The other group is dopamine receptor agonist action through post synaptic D 2 receptors and this is the first line of treatment usually and preferably this is in younger patient because there are the receptors are still very much intact and you get less symptomatic relief than levodopa, but have lesser incidence of fluctuations in dyskinesia. Duration of action is longer than levodopa that is why sometimes they are preferred and more CNS side effects than levodopa because they are primarily acting on the brain. Now these are bromocryptine is the one drug which is commonly used which is a dopamine D 2 receptor agonist is not used in fact because this has other side effects on lactation. Pergolide is a D1 and D2 receptor agonist, but this is has also associated with valvular heart disease and not much used. Premipexol is a preferential activity on D3 receptor family in addition to its a mechanism on dopamine receptor this also scavenges the oxygen free radical release and I said the free radicals is important during conversion from levodopa to dopamine and also during metabolism of dopamine and therefore this has a neuroprotective additional mechanism. Ropinirol which is a dopamine agonist is also another drug 
and roti gotin is available as a skin patch. The new development in Parkinsonism treatment is having a skin or transdermal patch of roti gotin which will release gradually the dopamine agonist and will have a control mechanism. All these dopamine agonist will have GI side effect nausea and vomiting cardiovascular because of the postural hypotension, dyskinesia, hallucination confusion and they are also contraindicated in psychotic illness, recent myocardial infarction, acute peptic ulceration, peripheral vascular disease and if you just see these are the all side effects which are related to catecholamine and in the heart or in the brain like that. Apomorphine as I mentioned is uh, not so commonly used as a regular Parkinsonism, but it is used as a subcutaneous injection and is used primarily an acute intermittent off episodic phenomena. When you are giving patient a drug holiday and the patient is not tolerating the symptoms which reappear, then to immediately control you give apomorphine but apomorphine is primarily not a drug for regular use. Selective monoamine oxidase B inhibitor as I mentioned inhibits dopamine breakdown in the brain and used as a adjuvant therapy to levodopa and this causes irreversible inhibition of monoamine oxidase B inhibitor and the drugs as I mentioned earlier selagiline and rasagiline and uh, another drug which is not yet available in India is safinamide and they are not preferred because of the drug interaction. They have monoamine oxidase inhibitors particularly when they act on monoamine A also then this can cause hypertension or hypertensive episodes. That is why it should be selective preferential monoamine oxidase B inhibitors. They may cause serotonin syndrome also causing stupor, rigidity, agitation, hyperthermia this is known to be seen when administered with morphine or opioid light drugs particularly with severe pain, tricyclic antidepressant and SSRIs because both tricyclic antidepressant and SSRIs are quite often given in patient of Parkinsonism because they have also associated depression and that is why this should be careful. If you remember the other mechanism was to give catecholamine O methyl transferase inhibitors and if you just see that there are two drugs one is entacapone which inhibits the COMT in periphery conversion. There is a tolcapone which inhibits the, the dopamine metabolism in the brain as well as in the, uh, in the periphery. Therefore, tolcapan has a peripheral action as well as central action and is more potent, but the only problem with tolcapan that this can cause hepatic toxicity. Therefore, entacapone is more preferred though it is less efficacious than tolcapan. The another approach of the treatment is to give anticholinergic drugs and the mechanism of action because the cholinergic mechanism is, ex, is enhanced you block this in the corpus striatum and may primarily this improves the rigidity and but has little effect on bradykinesia. So, if you just see rigidity and bradykinesia is also important. Also one of the important feature of Parkinsonism is called as a micrographia. The patient ask the patient to write a letter or write his name or address he will write in a very very small size letter which is micrographia and the handwriting will also wave off will be wavering as a typical Parkinsonism writing and 
if you see the patient responding to anticholinergic and anti -dopa and dopaminergic enhancing drug you see the patient will start writing better and this is one of the way how i can monitor my patient from 1000 miles i will ask him to send me his handwriting sample or write a letter every one month and you will see then handwriting improves that means the patient is improving and these anticholinergic drugs i try hexafenadyl benzotropine and procyclidine biperidine remember these are anticholinergic drugs why they are used because they are preferentially in acting on the brain what could be the potential side effect all side effects related to anticholinergic drug constipation dryness of mouth and glaucoma precipitation amantadine is another group of drug which was primarily used as a antiviral but now it is also used as has anti accidental finding was it was found to be anti parkinsonism and mechanism of action this alter dopamine release and it increases dopamine release it also has some anticholinergic action this is M N nmda receptor antagonist nmda is also increased because of the balance is disturbed which is an excitatory amino acid which causes further progression of neurodegeneration so that is why amantadine is preferred the only problem with amantadine is the benefits are short lived and after few weeks it does not show effect and the adverse effect is dizziness that's why some people use it some people don't prefer it the another drug is pima wanserine this is a typical antipsychotic and also used in parkinsonism because parkinsonism patient also associated psychosis and this has a inverse agonist and antagonist so this is a controlled release this is also not much used because this can cause qt prolongation and therefore can be a problem lastly there are some patient who will not respond to maximum dose of dopaminergic agonist or enhancing dopaminergic mechanism will not respond when also given concurrently the anticholinergic drugs or the antioxidants and this is called as a refractory cases in that the only option is trying surgical procedures which will not go into the detail neuroprotective agents are also being tried and lastly and gene therapy is also being seen now if i see if i recap the entire picture of uh, parkinsonism it is a primarily the deficiency of uh, dopaminergic neurotransmission resulting also into simultaneously increased balance increase in cholinergic the approach is to balance restoration by dopaminergic drug anti cholinergic drugs and the important thing is that they are the symptomatic thing we are yet looking for the cure and uh, we must also be the counseling to the patient is equally important because they suffer from anxiety depression schizophrenia and psychiatric illnesses also and the patients attendant should also be warned that the patient can have these symptoms if he misses the dose therefore compliance of the drug administration is important thank you very much for uh, hearing about uh, parkinsonism and the treatment of parkinsonism and uh, i hope you will be able to manage the patient of parkinsonism with the drugs which are available today thank you very much